on Wednesday nights. We're in the midst of this series on the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And in some ways, it's worthy of a focus from time to time in congregational life because we understand that as Christians, as people who believe the Bible in both the Hebrew Scriptures and the Greek Scriptures, the Old Testament and the New Testament, we understand this, that there is one God. Don't ever forget that, folks. There's one God in three persons. The person of God the Father, the person of God the Son, and the person of God the Holy Spirit. And of those three persons of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit gets the least amount of attention. I, I believe that is because a reason that Pastor Tommy has already explained to us here on our Wednesday nights, but I don't mind saying it again. The reason why the Holy Spirit gets the least amount of attention among the three persons of the Godhead is because the Holy Spirit wants it that way. The Holy Spirit has designed that the greater attention go to Jesus. He is sent to the world, the Holy Spirit is, to draw attention and to bring glory and to teach us to communicate about Jesus. However, that does not mean that the Holy Spirit is worthy of no attention. And that's why it's such a good thing for us to be having this Wednesday night series talking about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. The particular topic that I get to speak on this evening has to do with what a Spirit-filled life looks like. What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? And I want you to think, I think this is a very relevant question, because I think that if we have a wrong understanding of what a Spirit-filled life looks like, it's very easy for us to uh, start to live out a weird or a subnormal Christianity. I don't think God wants us to be weird, but I don't think God wants us to be subnormal either. We want to live what one author called the normal Christian life. But the normal Christian life isn't normal in the eyes of the world. It's a supernatural life. And we want to talk about it in those terms. What does it mean to live in the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit? So for my text here this evening, I'd like you to open up your Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to focus on three verses from Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 16. Let's take a look at these three verses. Paul the Apostle, writing to the churches of Galatia, but by the way, Galatia was a region. It wasn't just one singular church. It wasn't a city. So when Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia, he's actually writing to several churches in a region, the region known as Galatia. Ready for this? Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. That simple phrase that Paul used in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, where he says, walk in in the Spirit, I think that is so rich and so deep with meaning, we can talk about it a lot tonight. What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Now, understand this. Paul did not have in mind that you should actually, when you go home tonight, go take a couple laps around the block where you live, and as you walk around the block a couple times, walk in the Spirit. There's nothing wrong with that. It's probably good exercise, probably good for every one of us. And if you're going to do anything, you can do it in the Spirit. But do you understand that when Paul uses this phrase, walk in the Spirit, he's speaking metaphorically. He's speaking with this metaphor that our life is like a walk that we have. And the way that we walk says a lot. One of the ways that we're supposed to walk is we're supposed to walk in the Spirit. Now, this idea of a walk is very suggestive because, as I said before, there are many different ways to walk. 
Think of all the different words we use to describe how a person walks. You can stroll, saunter, amble, trudge, plod, dwaddle, hike, tramp, tromp, slog, stomp, or march. You can stride, sashay, glide, troop, patrol, wander, ramble, tread, prowl, promenade, roam, traipse, mosey, and perambulate. (laughs) Can you tell that I own a thesaurus? Think about it, but isn't it interesting? Each one of those words has a different connotation. Now, each one of us has our own walk in the Christian life. It's interesting to me that sometimes the Apostle Paul describes it as a race that we should run. Other times, he talks about it being a walk. But the whole idea is we have a direction, we have progress, and there's a certain manner in which we should do it. But no matter how you walk, if you stroll, when you're trudging, when you're uh, uh, jogging, when you're making good progress, when you're just perambulating, no matter how you do it, you should do it in the Spirit. Now, when we see Paul describe what a walk in the Spirit is like in these verses and in the following verses, he did not describe it as an obviously supernatural life. He described a walk in the Spirit in very normal terms of an obedient life to God, a life of victory in spiritual struggles, and a life of liberty in the Christian life. This is what Paul did not say, and you can look at it right here. Well, let let me read to you the false version of the Bible. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will see obvious miracles happening all around you. Did Paul write that? Not at all. Instead, he spoke to very practical life. Now, I want you to please note what I just said to you. I said the obviously supernatural. I did not say walk in the Spirit and you'll see supernatural things happen all around you. I said, obviously supernatural, because this is one of the things that I am firmly convinced of, that there is so much in our life that is naturally supernatural that we miss out on it altogether. But make no mistake about it, Christianity is a supernatural faith. Do you know what the foundation of Christianity is? Christianity is bold enough to believe that our Messiah, the focus of our Christian, the one with whom name we take when we call ourselves Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, we believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross. Now, can I tell you, there was nothing terribly unusual about dying on a cross. Matter of fact, on the same day, at the same place that Jesus was crucified, two other guys were getting crucified at the same time. Nothing terrible, unusual about dying on a cross, but there's everything unusual and supernatural about rising from the dead the way Jesus did. That is an undeniably supernatural event. So Christianity, biblical Christianity, the the, the kind of Christianity that we want to live all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament, all through the Gospels, all through the book of Acts, it is a supernatural religion. But it's easy to misunderstand the supernatural element in the book of Acts. What do I mean by that? You and I study the book of Acts. We read it, and don't you get thrilled when you read about the miracles in the book of Acts? Don't you get thrilled when you read about Peter and John at the gate beautiful, and when they see that lame man, that beggar, and they say, Silver and gold have we none, but what we do have we'll give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Isn't that beautiful? 
Peter, having received, as Daniel described last week, the gift of faith, he pulled that man up and instantly, I think it says that his ankle bones were strengthened and he was healed at that moment. That's supernatural. We love that. And then we read on another occasion that the disciples were gathered together in a room and they were praying for boldness and God shook the very room where they were at. That was supernatural. And then we read, this is the phrase that always gets me in the book of Acts. I don't even know if I can explain this. In the book of Acts, it describes that there were unusual miracles done by the hands of Paul. Hello? Unusual miracles? What, like there's normal miracles and then unusual miracles? But supernatural things were happening. It is a book filled with supernatural events. Christianity is a supernatural faith. However, back to the book of Acts. Don't you think it's important to understand that the book of Acts chronicles a 30-year period of time? Think about that. 30 years. And I'm here to tell you something. And I say this without the slightest bit of exaggeration. If you were to chronicle a 30-year period in the history of the Calvary Chapel movement and give the highlights in the same form as the book of Acts, it would read very much like the book of Acts. It's easy to read the book of Acts and say, it's an amazing supernatural miracle every chapter, and it is many times. But again, remind yourself, this covers the highlights of a 30-year period in the early church. Now, I don't mean to suggest for a moment that the book of Acts exhausts all the miracles that God did in those 30 years, not at all. But sometimes we just get a little bit, I don't know, off direction in our mind when we read and forget that this is talking about what God did over a substantial period of time. So, Christianity is a supernatural faith But if we really want to see what it means to walk in the Spirit and live in the Spirit, we need to give attention to what Paul wrote. Look at what he did write. May I read it to you again? Verses 16, 17, and 18, Galatians chapter 5. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. I see here in these three verses three very clear things that mark a life that is led by the spirit of God. Now I won't ask people to raise their hands. Because every once in a while, that's kind of awkward in a church setting because this is the kind of thing that each and every one of you should raise your hand at. And some people, they just don't like raising their hand, but then they really think, well, what? You don't agree with that? What's going on? So you don't need to raise your hand. (laughs) I I just feel that I want the mental and the heart agreement from each and every one of you that you're interested in walking in the Spirit. Whatever it means. Well, see, there were some people raise their hands. Yes, very good for that. Well, well, you're, you're on board and you say, whatever it means to walk in the Spirit, I want that. To tell me what it means. Let's look at the text and figure it out. But you realize this is something the way it should be in the Christian life. If we are believers, we should have an interest and, and even a pursuit of this idea. This is what it means to walk in the Spirit. So I see three things. The first one is found in verse 16. He says very simply, I'll read it to you again, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Number one, walking in the Spirit means a life of purity. Now, it gets kind of quiet in the room when I say that, doesn't it? Because purity in life and living, purity of body, purity of mind, purity of heart. These are difficult things, are they not? And and nobody does it perfectly. But let me tell you something. 
It's true for myself, and it's true for you. Anytime we fall short of God's standard of purity, we can never say, the Holy Spirit led me to do that. Is that even conceivable? The Holy Spirit led me into that impure thing? No. If I could consistently, repeatedly walk in the Spirit, I'll walk in purity. And when I drift off into impurity, whatever you want to say else, at least in that aspect, at that moment, I'm not walking in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will lead us into paths of purity. Now, I feel this right now that many circles, uh, prayerfully not so much among us, but many circles, th this is like, how boring. Isn't the Holy Spirit going to do something more spectacular among us? Isn't the Holy Spirit going to do something that's like really thrilling and grabbing and make everybody go, wow, maybe, maybe, this is what makes God go wow. Maybe this is the kind of spectacular living that God is impressed by. And he would look down on the believer that's really seeking to walk in the Spirit. And yes, he or she falls short. We are never going to walk in that complete purity until we are resurrected and glorified with Jesus. We understand that. But, but this is a believer who's committed to that path of purity. And you know what? When they fail, man, they're going to confess their sins and get it right with God and move on. When they seek to walk in the Spirit in that way, I picture God looking down from heaven going, yes! Th that's better than some kind of miracle. God is working in a heart that is normally given over to impurity and a lack of self-control. Brothers and sisters, that's a miracle. That's what it is to walk in the Spirit. Now, David, what do you mean by impurity? I'm so glad you asked. Take a look at verse 19 of the same chapter. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Paul's going to describe what impurity is like. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissension, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. That's a pretty important phrase, and the like. It, it's telling us I'm not restricting it to just what I listed here. Do you see what he's talking about here? Nobody can say the Holy Spirit led me into adultery. Nobody can say the Holy Spirit led me into fornication. And you could go down the list and use that same phrase over everything that he lists. You know, sometimes we long for a great work of the Holy Spirit, but we long for it for impure motives. We long for it because we want to thrill. Thrill us, Lord. And let me tell you, we have seen God do thrilling things, and we praise the Lord for it. And personally, I would love to see God doing more thrilling things in our midst rather than less. But don't you see that there's something misguided in the heart that just kind of says, thrill me, Lord, wow me. It's probably the same kind of heart that looks uh, or has the same perspective that Jesus spoke about when he said it's an evil and adulterous generation that seeks after a sign. Now, again, that's not for a moment to try to remove the supernatural from the Christian life. No, we love it that we live a supernatural faith. But don't you think it's very, very telling that when the Apostle Paul begins his description of what the life and the Spirit is like, he begins with talking about some level of purity in our life. Here's the second one. Verse 17, 
Verse 16 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit. Then in verse 17, he says, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Here's the point I draw from that. Walking in the Spirit means at least a measure of struggle in your life. I'm afraid that some people have the idea that the work of the Holy Spirit, for example, in my life, is to turn me into some kind of spiritual superman that is invulnerable to things. If I'm really living in the Spirit, I won't have struggles anymore. If I'm really living in the Spirit, I'll just rise above it all. I'll never have to struggle with real discouragement or depression. If I'm really walking in the Spirit, I won't have to deal with these other problems. I I won't have to deal with the stress. I'll just rise above it and just, oh, it'll be wonderful. Yes, Lord, I want to live in the Spirit. I'll tell you what God says in His Word. He says when you're walking in the Spirit, you're still going to have a battle. The flesh is going to war against the Spirit, and the Spirit is going to war against the flesh. And this is where we realize, Holy Spirit, you you may very well lead me into this kind of battle. It's not like the Holy Spirit says, "I, I come to take all the battle away, but I come to give you victory in the midst of the battle. You see, here is the idea. When we walk in the Spirit, the Spirit has the upper hand over the flesh. This is one of the reasons why God can use fasting and other forms of self-denial to such powerful purpose in our life. In some ways, when it's properly done, fasting is a way that I tell my flesh who's in charge. Flesh, you're not going to run my life. I'm going to under the filling and the walking in the Spirit, the filling of the Spirit and the walking in the Spirit, I am going to live a life that is above the base needs of my flesh and walk in the Spirit. Now again, I'm not trying to say for a moment that God doesn't care about our flesh or God wants to destroy our flesh. Listen, God has a wonderful plan for the flesh, so to speak, of the believer. You know what that wonderful plan is? It's resurrection. He's going to take these bodies and transform them. He has a wonderfully heavenly plan for this. But until God affects that, he says there's going to be a battle between flesh and spirit. There's going to be a battle between not only the bodily desires that I have, but also the things of my mind, my will, and emotions. Because in the Bible, the concept of the flesh doesn't just mean the meat on our bones. It also means these things that are just uh, uh, um, given to us in our human nature. As I said, our, our mind our will, and sometimes our emotions. These are all aspects of the flesh that the Holy Spirit wants to rule over. When a person is ruled by only their bodily appetites, it's a tragic kind of life to live, isn't it? Matter of fact, there's not much life there. But when a person under the leading of the Holy Spirit says, I'm in the midst of a battle and God helping me, the Holy Spirit filling me, there's going to be victory in this conflict between the flesh and the Spirit, then yes, Lord, this is what it means to walk in the Spirit. Now, there's a third aspect here. It's in verse 18. He says, if you are led by the Spirit... You are not under the law. Here's my third point. The first point was this. Walking in the Spirit means a life of purity. The the second point is walking in the Spirit means a life of some spiritual conflict. And then the third one is this. Walking in the Spirit means a life of liberty. We have freedom in Jesus Christ. When you see believers who are bound by legalism, when they are bound by the idea 
that if they take one step out of line, God's about ready to smash them. When they live with this idea that God is in a constantly frown mode against them. Listen, it's not the Holy Spirit leading them there. God wants them to live in what Paul called in Romans the glorious liberty of the children of God. And the glorious liberty of the children of God is based on this. I am made in right relationship with God, not because I'm so wonderful, but because a wonderful Savior paid the price for me and I love Him and trust Him. This liberty that Paul refers to, it's really based more on the idea of relationship. Now listen, I know that there's a very real and true sense that Christianity is a religion. But we all know what it means to be religious. You know that kind of very stuffy, sanctimonious, it's all about the rituals, it's all about the rules, there's no joy, there's no peace in it at all. Let me tell you something. Legalism leads to religion, or you could say religion leads to legalism. But I'll tell you this, The glorious liberty we have as children of God, it flows from relationship. Relationship with Jesus is what the Holy Spirit leads us into. And so when a person has a lack of liberty in their Christian life, they're not walking in step with the Spirit as they should. Now, I agree. There's all different um, dimensions. There's all different manifestations of how this might take place. Uh, I I may be not walking in the Spirit because I'm walking in completely the different direction. I may not be walking in the Spirit because I'm veering off a little bit. I may be not walking in the Spirit simply because I don't have the same cadence that the Holy Spirit has. There's degrees of this to be sure. But when I am walking in the Spirit, there's a level of purity in my life. There is a level of of spiritual conflict that I'm experiencing victory in the midst of, and there's a sense of liberty and freedom in a true relationship with Jesus Christ and not the bondage of religion. Now, I really believe that verses 16, 17, and 18 explain all that, but there's another aspect of what Paul says life in the Spirit is like. You're going to have to jump down to verse 22 of Galatians chapter 5. I read you that section, walk in the Spirit. Then he describes what a walk in the flesh is like. Now beginning at verse 22, he's going to begin to describe what a walk in the Spirit is like. Ready for this? But, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. That's life in the Spirit. Life in the Spirit is marked by the fruit of the Spirit. And the life that's filled with the fruit of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, that is a Spirit-filled life. Now, people ask... And believe me, this is a legitimate question. I don't mean to belittle this question at all. People ask, well, yeah, but where's the miracles? Where's the stuff? I I believe God has those. I believe God will fill our life with those things. Or at the very least, maybe fill isn't the right word. Maybe I think of it more as he'll sprinkle those over our life. He genuinely will. Listen, there are many many people in the Bible who experienced the miraculous but saw none of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in their life. I know it's an Old Testament example, but in principle it really strikes me. The Old Testament example of what the children of Israel experienced at Mount Sinai. The children of Israel came to Mount Sinai and they saw the thunder. They saw the lightning. They heard, and the book of Exodus describes this, They heard a trumpet blast from heaven announcing that God's presence was upon the mountain. Doesn't that give you a chill up your back just thinking about that? Can you imagine? They heard some kind of angelic trumpet. And if that wasn't enough, they heard the audible voice of God speaking from heaven 
the Ten Commandments unto them. That's what the book of Exodus says. It doesn't say that they first learned about the Ten Commandments because Moses or Charlton Heston read them to him from the tablets. <laughs> what went on those tablets was simply the recording of what God spoke to them from heaven. The audible voice of God from heaven spoke to them, and not 40 days later, they were dancing around the golden calf saying, this is the God that led us out of Egypt. Now, God is a supernatural God. God is a compassionate God. God is a powerful God. But His greatest interest is not in wowing us with the supernatural, but carrying on that wonderful work of transformation where the fruit of the Spirit is produced in our life. People come from all different types. There are some people, and I don't even know if I'm describing this correctly, so grant me a little bit of grace on this. There are people who seem to be just more spiritually wired than other people. They're just more sensitive to spiritual things. And there are other people who feel like, well, listen, you, friend, you may have your head in the clouds and you commune with God so wonderfully. I've got my feet more planted on the ground right here on the earth, and I love Jesus and I believe in Him, but you, you just seem to have this spiritual life that, that I don't seem to experience very much of us. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Some people are more like that, some people are less. But let me tell you what's beautiful about this. Every person can have the Holy Spirit work in their life producing the fruit of the Spirit. God isn't looking from heaven and saying, yeah, have you had enough experiences? He's looking from heaven and saying, is the fruit of the Spirit being developed in your life? And what fruit that is. Can I just read that list to you one more time? Because it's beautiful. The fruit of the Spirit, verse 22, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Don't you think we need a little bit more of those things in our world today? I certainly do. So that really helps us. Now, we look at this list, we look at the work of the Holy Spirit, and we say these are seemingly normal, daily aspects of life. L Lord, I wanted the Holy Spirit to fill me so I could feel a lightning bolt of electricity go right through my whole body, just like I read somebody else had. And instead, Lord, you fill me with the Holy Spirit so that I can sacrificially serve my wife and kids in a more glorious way. Do, do you see that there's something a little twisted in me that's disappointed at that? Because I'll tell you something, God's not disappointed at all. I, I don't doubt that if God were to give somebody some impressive spiritual experience, and I'm just using this as just a strange example. You know, the feeling as if lightning is going through them, and wow, it was such an encounter with God. If God were to give such a... I'm sure God might smile from heaven on that. But when that person is filled with the Spirit and sacrificially serves their, their family or other people in this world, I think the smile's a lot bigger on God's face. He's like, yes. I am at work in these ordinary things of life. And in these ordinary things of life, this is where it's very easy for us to say, hey, listen, um, God, I got this. I can do this. Um, I'll bring in your help for the spectacular things. But for the normal things of my life, you know, for the conflict I have in my spiritual life, uh, God, I, I got that. I've been walking with you for a long time. Uh, it's just thinking about purity. Okay, Lord, I know how to do that. I, I got this, Lord. It, it's so often in the ordinary things of life, we have a way of telling God, I, I can handle this, but Lord, I really need your help for the spectacular things. Well, I'm not trying to discourage you from asking for God's help in the spectacular things, but don't you see, this is exactly what our dependency upon the Holy Spirit should do. And I can't really do the things that Galatians chapter 5 guides me to do unless I am filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's what I want you to understand. God works through both 
the ordinary and the obviously supernatural. He works through the ordinary and he works through the obviously supernatural. Let me read you a quote from the book Why Grace Changes Everything by Chuck Smith. But by the way, may I just say, that is a marvelous book. Why Grace Changes Everything, you might think that it's a book just about the grace of God, and it is a book about God's grace, but even more so, uh, it's this wonderful man who is a marvelous pastor, and, and in some sense, God used him as sort of a father over this whole Calvary Chapel family of churches that we have. This man, Chuck Smith, his book, Why Grace Changes Everything, is just sort of, this is how to live the Christian life. It's a wonderful book. Let me read you a quote from that book. Here we go. He says, quote, Walking in the Spirit is an amazingly practical proposition. It doesn't mean that we float through life with a halo over our head and an angelic smile on our face. We can be spiritually minded and still relate to people about earthly things. Some believers react so strongly against the pervasive worldliness of our culture that they lose the ability to communicate with their friends, relatives, and neighbors. Walking in the Spirit doesn't take us out of reality. It allows us to function in reality with maximum effectiveness. I love that. You see, this is what we're looking for. We look for a naturally supernatural life. Or you could call it this. You could call it a supernatural, natural life. But we don't have to exclude one for the other. We can think God doesn't work in these ordinary things. It has to be spectacular. Brother, sister, that's a wrong way to think. If that's your thinking, I, I ask you need to pray and say, God, work on me in that area. I want to know that you work in and through the ordinary. But others of us think, honestly, well, God only works in the ordinary. Any of that spectacular stuff, it's probably of the devil. Well, listen, it, it may need to be judged and discerned, but God does amazing, unexpected things as well. No, God works in and through both, and we need to embrace both. Now, let me conclude with just sort of a few final kind of observations or implications in this idea of walking in the Spirit. Number one, if you walk in the Spirit, it means that the Holy Spirit lives in you. Isn't that a thrilling idea? That the Holy Spirit lives within us. Now, next week, Pastor Ricky Ryan is going to talk to us about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not going to, you know, w walk over what he's going to be sharing with us next week, but he's going to talk more about what it means to have the Holy Spirit in you. But walking in the Spirit is exciting because it tells us we have the Holy Spirit within us. We can just walk in that direction. Secondly, it means to be open and sensitive to the influence of the Holy Spirit on your life today. What a beautiful thing it would be if uh, some of you would just go home and uh, you, you take out that post-it note and you put it on the mirror because you're looking at the mirror every morning. You might not like what you see, but you look at the mirror every morning and you just say, walk in the Spirit. And when you see that post-it, you say, Lord, help me to walk in the Spirit today. I just want to make a conscious surrender of my life to the influence of the Holy Spirit I want to be sensitive to it. But Lord, you got to help me with this because I just get caught up in the day-to-day. -day. I get caught up in the natural all around me. All it takes is about five minutes of driving on the freeway and I've lost every spiritual thought that I've had. <laughs> it's so easy, isn't it? So Lord, help me. Lord, I want this, but you really got to help me. You got to draw my mind back to the operation and the influence of the Holy Spirit in my life. And it means to pattern your life after the influence of the Holy Spirit. You can say this, God, please guide me today. Or you can say, Holy Spirit, please guide me. But by the way, the, the normal focus of prayer for the believer 
is to pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus our Messiah through the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit. But, but nobody should think that it's wrong to say, Holy Spirit, could you please guide me today? He's God. He's not less God than the Father or the Son. It's totally okay if you say, Holy Spirit, would you please guide me today? I need your help. I need your influence. You see, the effect is the same when we simply consciously decide that we're going to depend upon God this way. So, you're going to visit friends. Just say, God, please bless this time. I give it over to you. You're going to read a book. And I don't mean reading your Bible. I hope you read your Bible, and I hope that before you read your Bible, you make at least at least a quick prayer, Lord, would you speak to me in your word today? But I mean, you can read any book, a book about anything. Holy Spirit, would you just show me something in my life or, or in this word, just through what I read? Now, if you're reading something that in no way the Holy Spirit could possibly speak through, then maybe you shouldn't be reading that. But the Holy Spirit could speak through anything. He could speak through a lot of different ways. You, you could say, I'm, I'm, I'm just driving somewhere. Jesus, walk with me where I'm going. It's just saying, Lord, I want to yield my life to the presence and the operation of the Holy Spirit more and more. Finally, and I had to leave this for the end. Because in some ways, I think I could have summarized my whole message in the two minutes I'm going to give you right now. And some of you go, oh, well then, David, why didn't you just give us the two minutes? Maybe we could have gone back and had more food. No, here's it. You really want to know what it means to walk in the Spirit? It's to live like Jesus did. Was there ever a more Spirit-filled man than Jesus of Nazareth? Who, though he was God himself, and had every right to draw on his own divine powers as he walked this earth. Instead, in some sense that I don't think we can fully comprehend, in some sense Jesus said, I will lay aside the prerogative I have to those divine powers, and I will choose to live my life as a spirit-filled man. And Jesus lived his life that way. That's why... If somebody is doing or saying or acting out things that in no way looks like Jesus would come within a 20-foot pole of that, it's reason to say, I doubt that that's really the Holy Spirit moving them. If the Holy Spirit's in it, not only will it give attention to glory, but it will look like Jesus. It'll have His touch on it, his fingerprint on it, because Jesus gives us the ultimate picture of what it is to walk in the Spirit. Now, I'm going to pray. As I pray, uh, Adam and our worship team, they're going to come forward. We're going to give some time for response here this evening. Prayer team's going to be up front uh, as we worship the Lord for a bit longer here. Um, I, I just invite anybody who wants to come forward for prayer, you're very welcome to do that. But I also want to invite you that in the midst of our time of worship, it's okay for you to simply pray and say, Lord, in this area of my life, I need to walk in the Spirit. Lord, in this aspect, in this arena, with this person, oh, Lord, I, I, I don't think I've been walking in the Spirit. Lord, when I deal with this person, the fruit of the Spirit isn't very evident. Would you help me, Lord, really to walk in the Spirit with them? There's going to be people up front who are happy to partner with you in prayer about just those things, but you can pray it on your own and say, Lord, make us a people, make us a community who more and more know what it is and how it is to walk in the Spirit. Father in heaven, that's our prayer. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the the beauty of your word. I thank you for the beauty of that list of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the beauty of the life of Jesus and how he gives us such a beautiful profile of what it means to walk in the Spirit. But Lord, we, we see in our own life, Lord, we need more purity. We need more victory in the conflicts that we face. Lord, we need... Um, 
We need a greater sense of liberty in our Christian life. We need more of the fruit of the Spirit. Won't you come upon us, Lord, and just uh, guide us as we seek to walk in the Spirit. Receive our heart, receive our prayers unto you. In Jesus' wonderful name.